Please take a moment to pause the video and reread the problem before listening on. Our goal is to find the total electric potential at point P that is created by this one fourth of a charged disk. And our strategy is going to be to actually calculate the electric potential from the completely charged disk. So in other words, instead of just one fourth of the disk being present, we're going to imagine that the entire disk is present. And then because the electric potential is a scalar quantity, we can simply take our result for the complete disk and multiply it by one fourth. That's going to give us the total electric potential contributed by just one fourth of that charged disk at point P. So to do that, to calculate the electric potential of the full disk, we're going to kind of take a look at a picture that looks like this. So notice again, we have the complete disk right there. And what we're going to do is actually select a very thin ring of charge. You can see this thin ring of charge in that reddish color. And we're going to compute the electric potential contributed by that thin ring of charge at point P up there up top. And in order for us to compute the electric potential of that thin red ring of charge, we need to know the total amount of charge on that thin red ring. Now, it's not going to be a lot of charge because it's a very thin ring. There aren't that many charges located on a very, very thin ring. So we're going to call that charge DQ. That's calculus notation. That just means that there's a very tiny bit of charge on that thin ring. Now, we probably have learned in this chapter that charge, or in this case, a tiny amount of charge, is equal to something called the surface charge density, symbolized by sigma, and then multiplied by the area of whatever structure you're looking at. Now, again, we're looking at a very thin ring, so the area is going to be teeny tiny, and using teeny tiny calculus notation, we would say that the area is actually dA. Now, to understand this equation, maybe we can look at the dimensions. So the sigma, which is the surface charge density, is measured in coulombs per meter squared. And then the dA, well, that's an area, so that's going to be measured in meters squared. And if you multiply those two together, you would see the meters squared cancel, and you would be left with coulombs, which is exactly what we expect for the unit of dQ, the unit of charge. So in other words, coulombs on the left side equals coulombs on the right side. So dimensionally, this equation makes sense. But now what we need to do is come up with an expression for the area of that thin red ring. Now, in general, area of a geometrical figure like a thin red ring or a rectangle or something like that would equal the length of your geometrical structure multiplied by its width. So this is just a general geometry formula. Let's think about the length of that thin red ring. The length of that thin red ring would be its circumference. It's a circular red ring, so if we wanted to know the total length around it, it would be the circumference. Well, take a look at that picture. You can see that the radius of that thin red ring is marked as r prime. So putting that all together, we're going to do the length as circumference, which is 2 pi times radius, but the radius of that thin red ring is symbolized by r prime. As for the width of that thin red ring, you can see right here that we've labeled the width of it as dr prime. dr, again, is calculus notation. It just means a very tiny length, or in this case, a very tiny width. So anytime you see a d in front of a quantity, it just means it's really small. So here we have the width of our thin red ring as dr prime. So this is going to be the area of our structure. In other words, this is dA. That's the area of our thin red ring. And what we're going to do is we're going to plug this expression for dA into our dQ equation. We next consider the expression for an electric potential produced by a point charge. Now, you've learned in this chapter that the electric potential produced by a point charge is going to be kQ divided by a distance. The distance would be from the point charge to whatever point is in question here. Now, we have a thin red ring producing a very tiny amount of potential at point P. So here we go again. We're going to use some calculus differential notation. So instead of saying V, we're going to say dV 
because that thin red ring is producing a teeny tiny potential at point P. We have our Coulomb constant, and then Q, of course, as you probably predicted, is going to be dQ. That's the amount of charge, very tiny amount of charge, on that thin red ring. And then that's going to be divided by the distance. Now, if you look at this figure carefully, the distance from any point on the thin red ring, whether we pick this point over here, or, hey, where'd you go? or a point opposite on the ring, that distance is going to be symbolized by that lowercase r. We need to come up with an expression for that, and let's go ahead and do that. And to do that, you can notice we have a right triangle right here, and that right triangle has hypotenuse lowercase r, and then the legs are uppercase d, and then that r prime. So we're going to use Pythagorean theorem to come up with an expression for that distance r. So we can see that the hypotenuse squared r squared is going to equal d squared plus this r prime squared. This is going to look a little awkward, but it looks like that. And then you're going to take the square root of lowercase r and the other side. So that's the distance r that the charges along that ring are from point P. Again, that distance is a sort of constant distance. So let's plug that in for our distance here. So this is cool. We've got a nice expression for the electric potential produced by our single thin red ring. And let's recall that the dq in this equation, so this term right here, that dq, we developed an expression earlier for dq. And we're going to want to plug that in because if we don't plug that in, then we would be ultimately integrating with respect to q, but our variable is r prime. Notice r prime is variable because it depends on where you choose that thin red ring location. So the way it's drawn here, we have a particular r prime value, but if we drew it a little bit extended further out, then that r prime, that radius of the thin red ring would be different. So all that's to say is r prime is a variable. But we don't want two different variables. We don't want little q and then r prime, so we're going to make a little substitution. Again, take that expression and plug it in for dq. And here it is. Now we have a nice expression for the electric potential created at point P by the thin red ring. And our variables are all sort of consistent here. Our variable is r prime. We're integrating with respect to r prime. Everything is looking pretty good right now. But this is just the electric potential produced by one thin red ring. You're probably noticing that that charged disk is made of an infinite number of thin red rings. It's not just that one thin red ring, but an infinite number of them. So technically, we would have to add together the electric potential produced by our thin red ring along with the electric potential produced by every other of the infinite number of thin red rings. And you're like, well, how do I do that? Because that would take forever. Luckily, we can integrate. Integration is a mathematical procedure that allows you to sum an infinite number of quantities, essentially. It's pretty spectacular. So what we're going to do is take our equation. We're going to integrate both sides of it. We just need some bounds for the right-hand side. And we want to know the electric potential produced by the entire charged disk. So we have to integrate starting at a radius of zero, which is the center of the disk, and then all the way out to the edge of our disk, which has a radius of capital R. So that is to say that our lower bound is zero. That starts at the center of the disk, and then we integrate all the way out to the edge of the disk with an upper limit of capital R. Now the left side of this integral is fairly easy. You probably know from calculus the integral of dV is just V. So that's pretty cool. We've got that settled. Now let's look at the other side, the right hand side. We do, it looks like, have some constants that we can factor out. We've got k, we've got sigma, which is the surface charge density of the thin red ring or of the entire disk itself, and then 2 pi of course is a constant. So we can factor all of that to the outside. So there is our integral, and that's not the easiest integral to compute. So we can actually consider doing a u substitution. So we're trying to figure out that integral right there. And in order to do a u substitution, we're going to let u equal the contents underneath the square root. That typically is a good strategy for u sub is to let u equal whatever is underneath a radical or whatever might be inside of a parentheses or a bracket. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to let u equal the d squared plus r prime squared. Now, you probably know from calculus that you would then have to differentiate this. We're going to do du dr prime. Now, d is a constant value. If you go back and look at the original picture, d is the distance from the center to point P. That distance is constant no matter where our thin red ring was located. So the derivative of a constant is zero. So you would 
kind of eliminate that term. And then here you just have a power rule. That's just going to be 2 times r prime now to the power of 1. Multiply both sides of that equation by dr prime, and we have du equals 2 r prime dr prime. Kind of ugly notation, but it seems to be working. So let's take a look at our in original integral, and then we're going to use our u sub to simplify it. So for now, we're going to release the bounds here because we're changing the variable into u's. So let's see what we've got here. We've got r prime over the square root. Now remember, underneath the square root was u. And then this dr prime, well, actually, let's see, the dr prime. Why don't we solve that for dr prime? Divide both sides by 2r prime. We would have du over 2r prime equals the dr prime. So that means dr prime can be replaced with du over 2r prime. Now that's pretty neat because the r primes will actually cancel each other out. And then if you look carefully, you have a factor of 1 half there. So you can factor out the 1 half. And now you have the integral of 1 over the square root of u du. Isn't this fun? So now the square root of u or the 1 over square root of u can be rewritten as u to the power of negative half. Now we just integrate using a power rule. So we're going to add 1 to the power. That creates u to the power of 1 half, and then multiply by the reciprocal of 1 half. So multiply by 2 is how I like to do that. And that simplifies to just u to the half. But let's not forget that u was d squared plus r prime squared. So we're going to fill in that back for u. And that's to the half. If we prefer, we can actually rewrite it as a square root. So that was that integral, but our bounds were from 0 to r. So let's not get too ahead of ourselves. Why don't we go back here? Let's grab this here. And then, since we just figured out the integral, let's just paste it right there. Yeah, that integral that's circled in yellow, we just figured out that that is equal to the square root of d squared plus r prime squared, but then the bounds were from 0 to r. So we're going to now plug in the bounds. You know from calculus that the upper bound plugs in first. So you're plugging capital R in for r prime. Just like that. And then you're going to plug 0 in for r prime. Now notice, when you plug 0 in for r prime, you're going to have 0 squared, which is just 0. So then you'll have the square root of d squared, but the square root of d squared is just d. And then we subtract those outcomes, and there it is, the value for the electric potential produced by a fully charged disk. But let's not forget, in this problem, they've removed 3 fourths of that charged disk, leaving us with just 1 fourth of the charged disk. So we can't forget to come in here and multiply both sides of this equation by 1 fourth, because we're only looking for basically 1 fourth of the electric potential produced by a completely charged disk. So we will just make sure to do that. And then we can simplify here. We've got 2 pi over 4. So that's just going to be basically pi over 2. So you're going to have pi k sigma over 2 times this bracketed term. Now it's time to fill in all of the values given in the problem. The sigma, the surface charge density, was given and it was given in femtocoulombs, so we'll make sure we multiply that by 10 to the minus 15, and then the values of D and R are given in centimeters, so we'll divide those by 100 to get them into meters. So everything is plugged in in standard units, and when you carefully compute that, you should see that the total electric potential produced by this one-fourth of a charged disk is about 4.71 times 10 to the minus 5. The unit is in volts, and that is the correct answer to the question.